Okay, hello. Welcome to our fifth, hello um, bass players for Black Composers workshop. Uh, today we're here with Clifton Joey Gidry the third, um, who is a bassoonist, composer, improviser, um, originally from Humble, Texas, um, near Houston, and um, is joining us today from Brooklyn, New York, um, and. Yeah, I wanted to start with um, what motivated you to start composing music, making music, making art. Um, how does your, you're a bassoon player, so how does your instrumental practice kind of inform or influence this process? Do you find that you work from the bassoon, work outward that way, and you're, as an improviser, do you find your compositions start from improvisation at the bassoon, or could you kind of talk about that? Yeah, so composing started for me um, pretty young. I was in middle school, and I in Texas, we do band, like wind band. Like, orchestra was never part of my life. I also um, didn't start playing bassoon until, like, the summer before I started college. So I played saxophone, and saxophone parts in wind band were pretty fun. Um, but I just, I don't know, I was a huge nerd, and I just wanted to write my own shit. So I started doing that and I asked my band director and I was like, how do I do this? And I remember like, I didn't understand how really key signatures work. So I wrote something with like a flat and the sharp in the same key. It just clearly that didn't work. So um, he started teaching me a little bit and my private lesson teacher at the time taught me a little bit and he was like, you should get Finale. And I was at the price and I was like, no, no, no. So he bought me Finale. Um, so it was really great. And I just did like fun things and they were all about space or a carnival. Um, and then I started practicing a lot, saxophone a lot more and I didn't compose for a long time. And then um, once I started at a different university, but then I transferred to Peabody and I had a really good friend there who's a composer and just seeing like composers at that level, I was like, so you hear a piece and then it just like turns into this, you know, like that whole concept like blew my mind. So um, I, kind of started doing improv in no composition at that point and then I this is gonna sound a little shady but I went to a concert here in Brooklyn and it got a lot of great support but then when I like saw what they were doing I was like I could do that <laughs> you know like what is keeping me from like jumping into this boat so um I tried and I had my first GPD recital at Manus and I wrote a little bassoon quartet and it went well so i was like okay we should keep going with this and um i like to really just hit the ground running so i just asked some people for lessons and started reading some books watching a bunch of videos um and it kind of blew my mind so with the improv aspect um at banff last year um well actually banff 2018 um mass swift is who i studied with for improv and she did conduction and i was like oh like yeah. this is this is what i like you know um because you know learning how to write um through composed music is very western it's very very western and a lot of songs um outside of the rest of the world western world are just passed down and like aren't notated i'm talking to my friend jose and he was explaining how a lot of mariachi music is not written down it's just like passed down family to family you know it's like that is amazing um so yeah, it has been really cool learning about conduction um, from Maz, from Mopsina, and Taishan. Yeah. So this past summer, um, we did auto schizoisms. People listening, that's Mopsina huh? Roberts and Taishan Sori. Yes, there we go. Full conduction. names. Yeah, which is the system um, created by Butch Morris. Um, yeah, I was hoping mm -hmm. that you, we would speak about conduction as we've used. It. Oh yeah. Yeah, and like with uh, Matina, she uses a lot of graphic scores and they are extremely mind-blowingly beautiful and um, all of these things. And I was like, okay, so everything I've always wanted to do is possible. I just never saw it happen in real time. So once I saw it and like got that validation, I was like, okay, we're gonna do this. Especially after being part of Taishan Sori's autoschiziasms, I was like, okay, this is the best thing I've ever done in my life. Like, this was so cool. Um, I love the idea of having a piece 
that will absolutely never sound the same. Like, I love that. So, um, yeah, getting to experience conduction, experience the freedom, and just, like, the very live collaboration with everyone of writing a piece together. But there is kind of one person that, like, has this idea but it's super open-minded with it. And it was like, okay, I don't really know if I have to come out of you right now, but I'm going to point to you and we're going to see yeah. how it's going to work. And the cool thing is, if it doesn't work, you just stop them. Mm -hmm. And it's a part of the flow. Yeah. I love that shit, you know? <laughs> so um, putting that into my compositions, um, the first piece I wrote that was performed without me is How to Breathe While Dying. And that was performed by International Contemporary Ensemble class at the news at Manus. So there was Manus students and people from the ensemble. And so I'm like with that, your website. Oh There's yeah. A video of that piece up on your website. Oh and, yes, GidryBassoon.com. No. Exactly. Um, and I had a like a really solid vision for this piece, but without having like formal training on how to write like on a staff and like all of these different terms, I was like, I'm gonna do conduction. You know, so. This is universal. You know, if you can read in English, like, we could do this piece. And, of course, if this piece could just be adapted in different languages, I would have to contact someone to translate it, you know? Um, but, essentially, that piece has four graphic etudes that I wrote um, and then a video screen of me doing conduction and dancing. Like, it's really some dude shit. So, um, but with some pretty dark um, themes about it. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of invoked the energy I wanted of just like, you know, I live with bipolar disorder. So I'm not gonna lie, like sometimes my life is trash. Like great things are happening, but on the inside, I'm just like, this is the worst shit ever, I've ever experienced in my life. But I love to laugh a lot. I love to like, just be goofy and like dance. Cause you know, I don't want to live in like squalor. Like I don't want to live in that terrible space. So it's how to breathe while dying, how to be alive when there's something, a part of you that's actively trying to ruin your life. Mm -hmm. So in that piece, you hear these like very light motifs and they're fun and all these things. And there's like other crazy shit going on in there. So with the conduction, it gave people the freedom to interpret that themselves, mm -hmm. but still, it was still like my framework and my ideas, but just like, I just wrote all the ideas on the canvas and they splattered the paint on it. And I love that kind of collaboration. Yeah. Um, so that really inspired me to kind of keep going in that direction. And now um, with graphic stories, I'm starting to put some notation in it um, to have more, a little more structure that I would like in some pieces and just like a growing and learning experience and like a different way to learn composition in my sense. And, still like reaching out to people that I really admire and being like, what do you think of this? How could I like kind of get this point across a little more, you know? So yeah, that's kind of how I got into composition and where I am today with it. And with the aspect of bassoon, um, the bassoon is very interesting. Like for all of my life until I got essentially my last so year at Peabody, I saw bassoon of like just Shostakovich nine. I thought that was like the epitome of bassoon playing. I was like, this is some really great shit. Like I get a whole movement and a half, you know, I was like, this is what I want to do. And I really wanted to win an orchestral job in a ballet. Like that was my dream. Still was kind of my dream. But um, once I met Rebecca Heller, I was just like, okay, like this is what I want to do. I did not know this instrument could sound like that. And I had kind of made these sounds before, but they were a mistake. Yeah. Um, and it was just so amazing to see what this instrument can do. And then going past that with myself, and I was doing a workshop with a friend, and he asked me to try to do some harmonics. And I was like, oh, I don't really know how to do that. And I was kind of fucking around, and I found this thing on bassoon, and I was like, I love that. And it's like in half of my album, you know? So um, it's been so fun to just like push my instrument to the bounds and still like using the technique I've learned. And I think that's something that gets lost when people think of contemporary music. Like, I still have to play scales so I can still, like, have clean runs in my music, you know, and have facility over the instrument, play long tones. So my microtone is 32 cents sharp and my actual B-flat is at zero, you know? So um, using that in the composition as well of, like, understanding microtones and really also kind of making a point of, like, this is a uh, B-double sharp. And then this is a beat, you know? 
Um, I want to hear both. And just really challenging people to like go into the, not challenging, but like putting people in this world of intonation that I like to live in. You know, I really love clashing chords, all of these things, but not in a way of disturbance and not just to disrupt, but just to kind of live in this world of like, okay, like this is okay. P what is peace? You know, peace to different people means different things. And low key, like when I hear things like that and then it settles and I'm like, yes, yeah. this is, this is where we were going. So yeah, with bassoon, it's kind of just, kind of like I said, it's just like pushing the bounds of bassoon and then also pushing the bounds of my music. And like, I don't know, I mean, just kind of going with it. And it's all an experiment, you know, some things I write, like they just don't work. But sometimes it does work. And I just go from there the next day, you know. That's great. Yeah, I, I had no idea that you started on saxophone. Um, oh, yes. Did you play tenor? Or I played out. I played all of them throughout high school. Freshman year, I did tenor. Sophomore year, I did soprano because we played Jupiter and I said oboe solo, and mm -hmm. we didn't have oboe. Um, but I played Barry sax for the rest of my time there. Um, did like the whole Texas All State thing. Mm -hmm. Never made All State, but just the whole system. It was really intense, and it kind of made me resent the saxophone. And then when I took music theory my junior year, um, I started hearing a lot of orchestral rep that I just didn't live in. I listened to a lot of wind band rep and like host like every other high schooler on the place of this planet. So um, once I started hearing Type 4, Riot Spring, Bolero, um, Scheherazade really won me over, I was just like, okay. But then when I heard Bartok and Terrible Orchestra, I was like, I need to switch over. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So I already heard bassoon was like super hard, mm. but you know, with really good pedagogy, like really anything is possible. Cause I had a really fantastic uh, first bassoon teacher when I was switching over for the summer and he ingrained so many great things into me um, to where when I did get to college within a year after playing, I was able to like get into Peabody and like now I'm here today. So, you know, great team will take you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so leaving saxophone was like the best damn thing I did in my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious now, um, because when we started up talking to each other about this collaboration, you sent me five records, um, and two of them are by mm -hmm. the saxophonist and composer Marion Brown, and yes. I'd love to talk about, first, about those records, and then we'll get to the other three, um, but I'm interested if, if you had heard Marion Brown while you were playing saxophone before you had switched to bassoon, or if that is a player that you came back to after the fact and what that did for you in terms of now seeing the saxophone again from a bassoonist perspective yes. as a around. <laughs> yeah um i heard about mary brown a year ago a year ago yeah about a year i think honestly just last fall mm. or this past fall i was listening to anthony braxton and then i listened to afternoon of a georgia fawn i have you heard that yes, yes. so i laughed for like 20 minutes yeah. um and i listened um, through yeah it was just it was great yeah. um and i was looking little, little to no saxophone playing on exactly it was just so funny especially coming from like you know afternoon of a fawn so i was yeah. like yeah. okay this is really interesting and at the bottom of apple music you know it always has like suggestions and i saw marian brown and the Porto Novo album, and I was like, okay. And I was just, and I was just like, hold up. Yeah, that's a whole other Where have podcast. you? Yeah. Yes, I was like, where have you been? So that was a huge, huge thing that blew my mind musically. Um, and he has the piece, and then we danced. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty long. Well, not like long, it's just long, the longest thing on that album. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, okay, like, wow, like we really went on a journey there. So that inspired like the piece on my EP and then we ran to the end of the earth and there was nothing like that title literally was inspired yeah. by that. Yeah. So I was just like, I love that. I loved it so much. And but to be clear, I've never hated the saxophone. I hated playing the saxophone. So, um, it's, I love listening to saxophone and I, God, okay, I hope I don't get shit for this. I wish all saxophone players played all of the genres, you know? Um, I wish there wasn't, like, a, such a division between classical saxophone from jazz. Like, let's do it all. You know, like, so, but, yeah, I feel like 
it would be awesome to pay homage to or homage. I don't know how you say that, but um, to a huge part of the rap of jazz with saxophone, you know. So, because so I was growing up with saxophone, I was always taught like you you did either or, which is so incorrect. Like jazz is so hard. I remember the, a lot of times it's one of these instruments. Yeah, you know, um, where it's like one or the other. Obviously, there's many like many upon many great bass players that can do both but um yeah early on it's one of these uh in in education there's this kind of division like all right do you want to go to the jazz road or the classical road and exactly it's kind of with, as a young person to have to yes decision. with classical saxophone you know playing like the Creston sonata or the tomasi or all of these things i was like okay i really just gotta practice you know what i mean like i just have to like play scales um, really get this articulation, get my tongue fast enough so I can do this, uh, make sure my low range doesn't sound like ass. So, and I'll see some modes. So I was like, okay, these are all things we can do. Like, this is in my power. Yeah. Um, and I went to this jazz camp. Well, I went to University of Houston band camp and there was a jazz band and I was like, might as well. So they were improv and improv and I was like, hold up. <laughs> we were in this key now, like a major labor in this key. Like, where, how did we do that? And that's why I was just like, damn, like these bitches are out here. Like they are playing. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So that really was so disappointing to me, you know, being black and like, this is our music. You know, I was like, I couldn't play it. And I had like this aversion to it because of what I was taught. And I was like, okay, we need to decolonize this practice. We need to get rid of this like anti-black mindset of jazz, you know, like it is not lesser. But when you have a white band director who is constantly saying that for four years of your life, um, it gets very ingrained in you. So, um, yeah, really unlearning that, listening to a lot of jazz my senior year and now today, and now getting to more of like the free jazz and everything like in that world and just hearing the saxophone in so many different ways, it's so amazing. Like, because also tone, you know, classical saxophone, tone, 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 tone. But what is tone? That is a white supremacist idea. Like, a lot of time tone, the examples of tone we use are from white people. Yeah. And you know, like they set the standard. By the word pure, which adds another level of... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's a very big thing on bassoon as well, is the tone mm -hmm. idea. And I'm just like, what sounds good to you, and if you're happy with your sound... And you have good intonation, good articulation, run with God. You know, like, be happy, be in peace. <laughs> so um, that is kind of, yeah, that uh, with the saxophone, I love it. I just love it in so many different styles. So Great. So I was wondering, those other three records that you sent to me, which were Shea Butter Baby by Ari Lennox, Black Terry Cat by Zini Rubinos, and Enye 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 by <laughs> Anna Roxanne. Um, oh yes yes yeah. so those three records um are obviously very different from mary or maybe not obviously but are very different from marion brown at least in my estimation while, upon listening to them and um and there's a big leap in time between those records the marion brown records being from the late 60s early 70s and these being a lot more contemporary um and i was wondering if you could you've gotten into it a bit talking about improvisation and classical music and conduction and all these kind of um, cross pollinations of those things. And I was wondering if you could kind of describe your musical style and where does it fall in terms of genre and is genre mm -hmm. important to you? Why or why not? And maybe you could wrap in those three other records. In, yes. In terms of this uh, collaboration, maybe. Yeah. With, Starting with genre and like the genre I would put myself in, I don't really know because you know when you're like putting out music, you have to like click yeah. what genre is like you're a part of. And I was just like contemporary bassoon, experimental. Um, I like I put cinematic because when I listen my music to people who aren't like trained musicians or just musicians in general, they were like, "It sounds like a movie score," and I was like, "Awesome." Oh, also, to mention so. You Darkness is a Myth, which is now out, um, which you self-produced um, and is up on Bandcamp now. You can find it. There's a link in your website to that record. Um, everyone should check mm -hmm. it out. It's amazing. There's there's an, a recent interview that you did. Thank you. On, what is it, WTOU? Mm -hmm. about, about that 
and um, people should check it out if they'd like to hear more. Um, but yeah, sorry, continue, please. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Um, woo, yes, so genre is really interesting to me because I feel like in the world I am with bassoon, like, I don't really know where it fits. And, but it's not like an othering kind of thing, but like literally, I don't know where it goes. So right now, like, I just like the experimental title and just like pushing the bounds and, cause I am experimenting, like that word fits. Like there is, oh my God. With the overtone things on bassoon, I have no idea what's about to come out, but it's so interesting that it still goes in the direction that I want to go. But the note, like I like truly, do not know what's about to come out of my bassoon. It's so fun. Yeah. And just keep you on your toes. So um, with genre, is genre important? Yes and no. Like to me, because it's kind of like a culture, you know? Um, and I feel like without genre, it would essentially raise a culture because like rap, R&B, jazz, um, hip hop, soul, gospel, so many other country music, rock and roll, created by black people. And I feel like when you kind of like get rid of the genres, it erases that history. Um, and it kind of melts it all together when they are, they have a lot of similarities, but they are different, you know? So I do like that aspect. I just wish with the genres, we were given more credit. Cause you know, Elvis Presley stole all of this music from a black woman. So, um, and all of these things, same with the Beatles, you know? So it with all of this, it like, I just want more credit to be put where it belongs. Um, so with those albums I sent you, I just, I mostly sent them to just kind of introduce you to them and kind of see the kind of world I live in musically. Um, I love R&B and I love ambient music. Mm -hmm. And Ari Lennox and Zena Rubinos, I would say are the two, probably the two people I've listened to the most in the last year um, and no name. Um, so, with Ari Lennox, there, I cannot think of the track. There is the best two over three I have heard in my life. <laughs> like, I was just like, what the fuck? Like, it was so, it's just so good. And it just shows you, hmm, why is this, like, why is this not compared, not even compared to, but why is Tchaikovsky put over this? You know, so like, with musical ideas, that piece should be studied in music theory. Like, that piece should be in ear training. You know, clap that. So, um, it's very important to me that music is not on a pedestal um, and that you can get musical ideas from everywhere. And when I was at Spoleto last summer, I was talking with a couple of people and I was talking about just like music and everything, of course. And I was like, what do you think of Solange's new album? You know, when I get home and they were like, who's Solange? And I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Like it's it was it blew my mind. I was really sad actually. I was like, wow, so you really just listen to Strauss. Like you wake up and listen to All Time. You know, like it just it it makes me sad because like it's just such a I don't want to say closed minded, but it's like pretty close minded. Like music is inspired by everything. And when I listen to um when I get home it is minimalist music and it flows very well. There's such beautiful melodies and it's just so like beautiful. I want my bassoon playing to sound like that yeah. with um, New Apartment by Ari Lennox on Shea Butter Baby. That song inspires so much hope into me because you know, living in New York, everyone wants to live alone. Yeah. She's talking about getting her new apartment, all the things she's doing in her new apartment. And it truly inspires me. Like it invokes so much emotion. And with Zena Rubino's Black Terry Cat, that shit is just amazing. Like, in so many ways, it tells such a beautiful story. It hits on so many different communities in the Black and Brown community. And, like, um, she talks about how, like, there's all these, like, fancy restaurants. And they have, like, Haitian chefs, Black chefs, Mexican chefs in, a, like, a Chinese restaurant. You know, like, all these different cultures are, like, still using us but not giving us credit. You know? So, um I love her message and I love how versatile she is in her music. Like a couple of her other albums, I'm just like, wow, like this is the same person. Yeah. So that's essentially why I sent you those. And cause music just needs more perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think as a bassoonist, like the Mozart bassoon concerto is what we will play forever. I still play that, you know, I still take auditions and it's really difficult sometimes to, um, 
just really get the right rhythms because you know a lot of people play the dun dun dee dun dun, dun. they put a triplet there you know it's super easy to turn a die 16 into a triplet so um but if i'm playing that to the beat of meg the stallion guess who's not playing a triplet yeah right me so it's just like the rhythm in rap is so strong and it's just like it's not other music rap music who doesn't like rap music who doesn't like to shake their ass you know so it is so important to ingrain these things. That's what I do with my students. Like, there is, look, you're going to listen to everything. Unless it's, like, WAP. Because, you know, the kids, I don't know if they're ready for all that. But um, it's very important to me. And with Anna Roxanne's album, or I think EP, it is so great. And it was, I think, my first introduction into um, ambient music of that style. Because mm-hmm. um, I have always wanted to write music like that. And the piece on, oh, Marjorie Sharp Davis, which is by my grandma, um, that piece had a lot of influences from her because she just used so many different things. And it challenged me, like, how did she get that sound? You know, and how is it such high quality and all these things? So I was like, I guess I'm going to rub these Prosecco bottles together and see if I can, like, get some sounds like that, you know? And just going around my house and like scrunching up things. And like, and my mom was just like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, Shh, it's art, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> no judgment. So, and she, um, it was so interesting to her too. She was like, you were such a dork, you know, but um, listening to her music and also ended up turning into like one of my like mental health go-tos, you know, if I'm feeling very not great because with bipolar you have manic episodes and since i have bipolar type 2 i have hypomania um and which is essentially um a smaller like not as intense manic episode and it lasts for about one to two days when a manic episode can last for like one week to two weeks with a very intense crash of two weeks of like depression so my crash is like it's just all shorter essentially mm-hmm. um but that's me it could be different for a different person so i know sometimes when i'm manic it is compared to being on cocaine um, or just being really, really hyper and you feel amazing. A big thing people say is that, like, a good way to tell if you're manic is if it's 3 a.m. and you're cleaning your closet, you know? So, <laughs> and that happened to me a lot, you know? So, um, that's my key go to. And if I just need to calm down, I listen to her Nocturne on that EP and it is like off this earth. Like, it's so, so amazing. Um, so that EP was just so beautiful and I aspire my bassoon playing and bassoon tone at times to sound like that entire, the emotion Nocturne brings to me. So just to like use these records, all three of them and many more, and pedagogy, you know, and the idea of tone and all of these things and rhythm and cause you know, hip hop artists, rap art, like that rhythm, it's just impeccable. So especially with, I mean, jazz as well. Like there's just so many things we don't incorporate into these classical conservatory programs that is a shame, you know? And that's why, you know, some people leave those schools with not the best musical phrases and rhythm. So um, you just need a multi-dimensional like view of music cause it's not narrow. It's not narrow at all. But it's just as a bassoonist and teacher, like, I'm not about to just promote classical music. Like, we're going to examine everything, especially music that my people have created. So. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Cool. So maybe um, you want to just hop into some playing now? Talk about that. Yes, let's do it. Great. Cool. So I just want to preface so. to say to the audience that um, throughout this process, mm-hmm. you've recorded videos on a 360 camera with projections of yourself with pre-recorded um, conductions and then um, sent those to me and then I interpreted them as a one one a single viewing score and then sent those recordings back to mm-hmm. you. So now we're going to be referencing um, that video and talking about techniques for the bass that came up in that, uh, that session. Yes. So starting with a share computer sound. Um, So starting, oh, look at this man. So um, let's see. Oh, yes. Okay. So starting with this sound here. I would love for... um, to start there, like for the beginning of the piece. Great. So what exactly are those harmonics? So 
That's actually um, what's called Sulpanicello, which means it's like okay. close to the bridge. So uh -huh. it's just um, S-U-L-P-O-N-T-I-C-E-L-L-O. -E um, and so that's this, this kind of sound. You get more of the overtones as opposed to uh -huh. typically playing down here. As you okay. go up, it kind of filters out some of the lower tones. Um, Okay, okay. Simultaneously with that, I was doing some uh, detuning. Okay. Uh, these kind of sounds. So if we were to start the piece with just harmonics, oh, actually starting with the solo ponticello for maybe like 20 seconds. Okay. And then starting to add in the detuning. Okay. Can we try that? You know, Ross, I think actually no detune, just oh. that actually. Okay. Yeah, I loved that by itself. So I shall should tell you that the idea I have for this piece is in three, three parts, essentially. Um, and so with that, I love to start with that. Is it, what's the softest you could play it, but with still so much resonance that you just had? Um... I'll try probably close to that because you'll get kind of these great air sounds if it's really quiet. yeah is that what you're going for or would you rather have pitch um I would say kind of split the difference between what you first did and that okay just now You can start to crescendo. At this point, I can't. So where you <laughs> just, oh, sorry. I, I just couldn't hear you past that point. So I wanted to make sure you weren't saying something. Oh no, it's, I didn't really talk at okay. that point. Um, where you just were, where things started to get very crunchy and very dissonant even more, does that come with a higher dynamic? Um, I'd say yes. Um, okay. You can do kind of crunchy stuff. Um, actually, so that really kind of comes from overpressure of the bow. So putting more okay. pressure in the right hand, which kind of crushes the string. So that, that kind of, uh, comes with more volume. Okay. Um, okay, cool. And then at 50 seconds. So with the, um, strumming, I guess, are you pizzicatoing there or are you just like strumming? Yeah, just kind of, it was like all strings at once. Um, okay. I can do individual strings with the left hand. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Can you try that one more time? Totally. Just the, the whole. Oh, what you just did. Oh, with the. Oh, with a soul ponticello and strumming. Is that possible oh, at yeah, the totally. same time? Oh, that's great. That's a yes. Okay. Cool. I wonder if you have an opinion on if, if there is no detuning in the beginning, 
if there's an opinion on the tuning of the bass because right now it's like very different than what it was in the video because um, mm -hmm. I guess the thing in the video there in that opening section there's a lot of and throughout the video a lot of these elongations of the dimensions from the video and that's mm -hmm. kind of what I was portraying with that that tuning um, and the nice thing about that is is very improvised tuning, so the bass will always be tuned a different way for every performance of it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that's something you like, or if there's yeah, I I like that. So how I figured out how to do that in a video is by mistake, and I was like, ooh. Yeah. But I think actually with the detuning, so with the beginning and the end are going to be the same. Okay. And then, but ending with the detuning with the same with the video, like stretching apart like that. Okay. So it's coming back. Got it. Um, because I do really like it. Yeah. I guess I wonder then at the beginning, um, do you want it to be in kind of standard tuning? Um, I guess, yeah. Okay. Let's try it. Let's, what does it sound like in standard tuning? It would sound, these would all be kind of fourths. But you're still going to get all those overtones, so it'll like still be crunchy. Yeah. I think I liked it detuned. Yeah. I, I think yeah. the interesting thing about that, just knowing what you said about your work so far, like it will always be different depending on the the performer, like how mm -hmm. they choose, how far or up they choose to detune. Um, and then that will create like a different mm -hmm. result every time, which I think would be really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially with the first section, it would be a lot of this for a while. And so with tremolo, can you tremolo and sopan? Is that yeah, the, absolutely. can you do it at the same time? That sounds like Okay, so. And how loud could that get? Yeah, loud. <laughs> yes, look at God. Okay, so that is exactly what I want. So essentially the structure of the first part would be starting with very soft self cello and slowly working in the strumming, not really at a certain rhythm, yeah. um, but then eventually kind of falling into a rhythm, but not a groove. Um, and then really start to... Um, bring in the tremolos with sopont and crescendoing that and start adding in some bartos pizzicatos um and that's essentially how um, it will go on for a bit and then quickly going down so if you were to play um the loudest sopont with some bar talk pits and then immediately go to a very soft harmonic um and then going right back so it's kind of like a call and response kind of thing of just like kind of like your inner self like kind of like Hey, bitch, like listen yeah. to me but the anxiety and everything is just like overcoming cool yeah um so are you just talking about like like a bar talk that's just on an open string i, I assume yeah yeah so like you said loud loud tremolo bar, bar talk super loud yeah as loud as possible so And is there to make that more of like a conversation? Yeah. So that was fantastic. Um, and if you were to keep going and then having a, like, I guess the last time I would have you do that crescendo a lot, um, and then immediately start going to some very aggressive playing. 
Okay. And that would transition you into the second part. Got it. So do that for a while and then just go into aggressive playing in quotes. And just yeah, um, like shredding a lot of um, Bartok pits, very high, going down. I wrote here, like, don't hurt yourself, you know, like, don't get tendonitis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, essentially, like, you're going to build. Um, what I will write for you in the passage you just played of just, like, start with the harmonic and then start to really speak with it kind of create your melody or i'll write a little melody for you to do each time that grows should the harmonic line kind of add one each time is that what you're thinking um uh, yeah essentially and then towards the end of that um instead of having you end on a pitch just like have a big crescendo and immediately go into some pretty aggressive styles of playing okay by the way, should all the tremolos start from as loud as possible, or should they work up? Like oh, as here? at this point, as loud as possible. Okay. I would look for um, just more of like very fast scalar patterns, um, mixing in more pizzicato, mixing in um, going from very low fast playing to very high, not so much the manic energy of like what the fuck's going on, okay. you know what I mean? Cool. Um, so you said it's kind of scale. These kind of yeah. passages, okay, cool. And then interrupt the scales with pizzicato or going to tremolo, um, but everything pretty harsh. Whatever technique you go to, um, and I'll write which techniques I'm looking for um, to interject with at certain times, but um, whatever you do is really aggressive and loud. Not so much any techniques that are, um, that could be softer, like what you just did. Gotcha. <laughs> Basically, um, all of that is, no, I love that. Okay, cool. um, with that, and start working your way down to just holding a low B drone. Like you're, you can play low B, right? Low C. Low C, yes, like the cello, okay. Okay, so eventually working your way down to getting there yeah. um, from wherever you are in the world. Um, and that will be your transition into the second, I mean, the last section of this piece. Okay. Um, but with that, like, with that, at least on bassoon, if I'm playing like that long with that aggressive um, pattern and as fast, that would hurt my wrist. So yeah. are you feeling any yeah, pain bit, from that? Yeah, a bit. I think, um, yeah. it would be the thing that knowing the timing beforehand, I would be able to kind of save and exert the energy needed. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I think um, I'll be able to uh, do it in a nice way. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I just know, like, Brickner 4, you know, with yeah. the opening tremolos, all the string players are like, why? Um, okay. So if we could go, um, like, towards the end of, like, kind of, not instead of, like, how the last movement really worked up, but really started working down. Okay. Um, to the seat. If you wanted to do, like, t maybe, like, 10 seconds of something crazy and then getting to the C. Sure, sure. Yes, that was perfect. Cool. Should I... So you were showing me. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just go go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, with the C, if you were to um start adding in some microtones around the C, can we try that? Sure. The only thing is, I can only go above. Okay, that's fine. So. I think we might be too low. I yeah. think this C, it's nice, but can you try up an octave? Sure. Well, the other thing I could do is uh, do do the C octave against it, and then you get that beating. Yeah. If we were, if you were to play a a line that essentially sounds like. Something yeah. like that on bass. What would that sound like? So. That kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to go from like living in this world of the C, um, yeah, starting with the C's again, mm -hmm. and then interjecting with that line. So, always a long tone and then move down? That kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Actually, okay, no. <laughs> okay. But what you just did, starting on that, was that a harmonic? Like the very yeah, so it's like, thing you uh, just did. Well, it's called a false harmonic. So you're you're playing a fundamental below, pressing it down, and then playing. Usually, it's called a touch four, or a touch five, meaning touching the fourth or fifth above that, like finger fourth or fifth above that. How soft can you play that? Oh, very soft. As, so as soft as anything. Could you actually, um, so could you pick different notes to do that on? Yeah. Or like, okay, could you do the C melody again and really start making it very crunchy and uh, very dissonant and then switch, like slowly switching over to this world? Okay. Of the false harmonic, yeah. Got it.
you still like those? Oh, yes. And I can even add in some of the sea again with the pits. That would be great. Oh, yes. Jesus. Okay. And can we start working down, like keep playing, and then start working down back to the low C? Yeah. And then when you get to the C, start to detune. When you say detune, do you mean detune the C string or do the detuning like we talked about in the beginning? Sorry? Oh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, what'd you think of that? I, I think we figured out the ending of this piece. Great. <laughs> I like it a lot too. <laughs> Um, is, can we hear the detuning of the C? Yeah. And then eventually just keep going until you just demandio, miente out, you know, yeah, right. but keep detuning and then just fade out. Yeah, if it can over, go on a little longer, over a longer that, period of time. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I'm already just pretty. Deep, so, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would say that is um, exactly what I'm looking for for the end and the beginning. I like a lot. So it's just the middle section of because um, I see this piece being around like no more than seven minutes. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm it's just counter. working in the way of. The middle of being so if it's like 20 seconds of something really aggressive and then like not so much and then another 20 seconds and not so much. Is that healthy for bass players? Yeah, I think so. If um, OK, yeah, depending kind of like on what's notated execution wise, mm -hmm. if it's more up to the player as a kind of aggressive playing thing, I think that's completely fine. You know what I mean? OK, yeah. Because what you did at first, if you were to play um, something very aggressive, something very fast, something very loud, what a lot of pits, um, and then switching between like the manic quiet, or not even quiet, but just switching between that. Yeah. Um, how does that feel for you as a player? I think it's okay. Um, so back to the kind of scalar passages, like. <laughs> Yeah, so with the that kind of thing, sorry. With the scalar passages, um, if you could duh, gliss, duh, like add some glissando in there. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, do you want maybe separates too, like or I would say not so many glissando. Yeah, yeah. Like cut back by like 80%. Totally. Um, but essentially, yeah. Um, yes. Cool. And do you like them up and down or just down? I think just down. Yeah, okay, cool. I, I want to just How many... some register and very. No, thank you. Yeah. 
How many notes can you glissando at one time? Um, two. Okay. Yeah. And can you do it? Yeah, yeah, okay. So we try that um, with the same kind of passage? Yeah. With two? And, oh, sorry. With, and then getting, um, so starting like that and with glissando going down, but eventually working your way actually up the bass until you're at the bridge too much. Um, so much, and the, it's very high, and all of that kind of thing. So, sorry, can you say that one more time? So, starting with the scale, yeah, glissando. yeah, starting to scale your passages, adding some glissando, adding more Bartok pits, um, adding some sopont, and then just like slowly decrescendoing until you get um, very high into the cello, cello, into the bass, high register wise. Register wise, yeah. Okay. So as I go higher, get get softer, and then start going into those false harmonics. Instead of going down to the low C, we're gonna go to the false harmonics and then use that as a transition. Got it. Okay, cool. Yes. And I would say, okay, basically what I would say about the glissandi is only use them actually when you feel like you have something to say with them. Yeah. Right. You know, they should be a statement. It should be very loud, very disruptive. Mm -hmm. But, and if that means you only have like one thing to yell about, then like just do it once. Totally. But um, I don't know if it's, it's probably just Zoom. If there's, is it really loud on your end with the runs or our runs very loud on the bass, I think is the more important question. Yeah, it's, it's pretty loud here. Um, okay. I guess that's probably about the loudest that stuff kind of goes. Okay. You know. Okay, that actually works. So I know what I'll send you for that, for this section. Okay. Uh, but that pretty much works. Yeah. Yes. Um, cause I want this section pretty wild, but also tendonitis. Um, so yeah, I think, and I'm just working all the way back to the front. Um, could we start again with the soul pont? Yeah, sure. And can you hear me while you're playing right now? Right now. Yeah. So I'll, Keep playing and I'll start to like give instruction. And start to add in the strumming. If you could strum a different pitch. So that's the thing is it's uh, sort of no, unless I detune. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. So I guess that's a thing to consider. Would you like the performer to like detune to a randomized tuning before starting the piece? Or would you like during that section to, you know, strum maybe a few times and then detune and then strum again? Because that'll, that would be an interesting kind of change. Yeah, let's try that. Okay. So I'll do like three strums and then change just for simplicity.
Okay. Can so while you're playing this, can you start adding in this melody with the hum of Okay. So use that as the like the cell. Da, 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 and then do whatever you want with that after a couple of times. Okay. Um, and even if you just start it with like, da, da, and so slowly start adding in that humming because this is going to transfer over to those harmonics later with that melody towards the end that okay. I will give to you. So is that? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Very hum as loud as you can to where it's hard, but still very not present. But still mouth closed, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh. Well, let's see which works best. falsetto or an octave above oh yeah sure Can you... and a lot softer that's good uh softer. Soft, softer good yeah good octave but yeah okay is the the playing is a good volume but just the humming okay oh yeah yeah uh the strumming could be a little softer okay Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do Beautiful. for there. Um, and then start to crescendo the bass, but your voice is going to get lost because your voice is going to transform into the harmonics. Okay. I guess, wait. So if you, um, so if you let go. What'd you say? Oh, I was just going to say the harmonics, um, depending, I, I guess just send me that, um, that line and I got to see, like, cause I assume you wanted to lay on like natural harmonics, um, mm -hmm. but it might not, but we'll see. And then okay. depending on the tuning, um, but it is something that I could do like. I can do it as possible. Yeah. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So with that section, it would just be like da 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 da, and just keep getting interrupted by these. Yeah, that if you can do that dynamic every time, we're uh, we're in the money land. <laughs> well, it's it's easiest on this string. Really slaps the C string because it's the longest. Uh huh. Um, these ones are also that that would be the loudest for sure. So maybe do you want to just keep them all in the C string? It'll have the most kind of. I would say the yes. Okay, so it could be like. Oh, sorry. But rock. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't worry about that was great don't worry about so much of landing the pitches because how you just missed it and slid into it was great okay cool yeah
So eventually, don't keep starting at the same part of the melody. Ah, right. Start um, going at a different. Uh, but essentially, yeah. So let's jump. Because um, I have to run really soon. Let's jump towards um, the end of this phrase, um, where there's not just pit interrupting it, but also like much stronger tremolo, some other things working in. So we're gonna start working in the things that are gonna be in this next movement. Got it. Got it. Which is the one we just worked on with this stuff. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I can I can kind of do. Uh... <laughs> and keep going yeah so i would say try to get through the melody da, da, da. interruption da, da, da. De, de, da, de. Uh, and then go like don't um i would say don't do any more than three interruptions Got it. Um, after the third one go to the next movement okay but um i would say start with simple interruptions like the pids um some soul pawn and then eventually start working in more and then we're going to go into this next movement yeah, sure, sure. that makes sense great sounds like we have a piece great all right i look forward uh Yes. And there's going to be a little bit of a visual um, element. Most likely, I'm going to see about that, but I would say like nine times out of ten. Um, cool. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much um, to Joey. And um, you can check out their new EP, which just came out on August 7th, which is entitled Darkness is a Myth. Um, and there's much more at their website which was mentioned earlier which will be linked afterward um so yeah thank you so much joey for being here and uh look forward to this piece thank you yeah yeah i thank you for having me if you want to see more of me you can follow me on the gram at j-o-e underscore w-e-y joe way um and i post some really goofy shit so i hope you enjoy it but yeah thanks for having me and i look forward to hearing what you do with this so Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.